Well, hi everyone. On March 18th, 2025, NTSB released what they're calling Safeguarding Bridges from Vessel Strikes, Need for Vulnerability Assessment and Risk Reduction Strategies. So I'm recording this video on March 25th, 2025, and essentially what they've been saying are things I've been saying for over a year now relative to the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse, as well as the vulnerability of other important bridges over waterways throughout the United States. So I'm gonna tie everything together in this video, but also there are still sh serious shortcomings with this NTSB recommended approach, but it's a good start perhaps. I, I, it's not the end all be all that I think people want to believe that it is in terms of assessment methodologies for the risk profile for these bridges. So as you know, I've done many videos about the Francis Scott Key Bridge, and consistently I've pointed out that I believe that the Maryland Department of Transportation has significant liability with regard to the collapse of the Key Bridge, and that has mostly to do with the inadequate pier protection that existed at the main pier locations on the main span. The main span of the bridge connects Pier 17 and Pier 18, and of course it was Pier 17 that was destroyed by the Dolly impact on March 26, 2024, that led to the sudden collapse of the bridge. And what was interesting about this NTSB report, if you go near the end here, therefore the NTSB concludes that had the MDTA, the Maryland Transportation Authority, conducted a vulnerability assessment of the key bridge using AASHTO's method two vulnerability assessment calculation, the MDTA would have had information to proactively identify strategies to reduce the risk of a collapse and loss of lives associated with a vessel collision with the bridge. And again, it's just kind of silly to think that you have to do a detailed calculation that's based on a lot of key assumptions, and I'm gonna go over that here in a bit. But essentially, you know, exclude common sense when you have massive ships passing underneath a bridge right next to the piers with no protection. You need to do a calculation if you think, uh, you know, you wanna assess what the real vulnerability is, which again, is nonsense, and I'm gonna explain that. So as a result of the events around 9-11, in 2001, various bridge owners started assessing the risks to their bridges. And it wasn't so much from accidental events, you know, bad actors potentially, what could they do to a, a vulnerable bridge? And uh, State of Maryland examined several bridges, including the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And I submitted a Freedom of Information Act request for public records associated with this study and I got nothing back. I mean, it was completely redacted. I mean, why? It's common sense, again, will tell you when you have these massive ships, 100,000 tons, just, just huge ships passing in close proximity to an unprotected pier, bad things would happen accidentally or otherwise. So this design methodology where you assess the risk of a vessel impact to a bridge that could cause damage was mandated going back to 1991 through this AASHTO publication that was updated in 2009. And AASHTO stands for the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials. These, this organization consists of individuals from state organizations. So, so they exempted themselves for the application of this assessment methodology to any existing bridges. They just applied it to any new construction, which doesn't make a lot of sense. And as we've seen with the Francis Scott Key Bridge, it had disastrous consequences. So those AASHTO guidelines were an offshoot of the aftermath of the 1980 bridge collapse that was caused by a vessel impact on the Sunshine Skyway Bridge in Florida in 1980. When they rebuilt the bridge, they had very robust peer protection systems in place. And unfortunately, many other owners of existing bridges just didn't seem to get the memo. But in general, there was very little done to assess the risk of bridge collapse from vessel impacts. Now, going back to the Francis Scott Key Bridge, we know that it had two sets of dolphins upstream and downstream of Pier 17 and Pier 18, and they're only 25 foot in diameter, very small dolphins, and of course the dolly never impacted any of them. An interesting thing about this NTSB report is they reference a previous collision between a vessel and the Francis Scott Key Bridge. 
This occurred in 1980 with a 390 foot long Japan flag container ship called the Blue Nagoya. It was much smaller than the Dolly and it collided with Pier 17 following a loss of steering 600 yards from the bridge. So the vessel was stopped by the crushable concrete and timber fendering system at Pier 17. But again, apparently they didn't say, well, what if this had been a much bigger ship or a ship that was traveling at a higher speed? Maybe we need to upgrade the protections. That apparently didn't happen. Now, as you know, I'm very critical of this Ashto methodology. I liken it to the benefits of writing a business plan. If you start a business, you absolutely should write a business plan because it gets you thinking about the risks and what your market is and how you're gonna go about getting work and executing the work and so on. But no one in their right mind thinks that they can guarantee success by virtue of writing a business plan. So I think this methodology should be employed qualitatively. There's an old expression that, you know, sometimes somebody's so smart they're dumb. That's what I feel about this methodology. In my opinion, this methodology lends itself to something that appears far more accurate than it really is in terms of assessing the probability of failure from a vessel impact to a bridge. Let's go through this here in a bit of detail so you'll see what I mean. So this Ashto Method 2 vulnerability assessment calculation is used to determine the annual frequency of collapse AF, which is the probability of a bridge collapse due to a vessel collision in a year's time. The total AF is based on the sum of the AS for each pier that is vulnerable to a vessel collision from both inbound and outbound traffic. This vulnerability assessment calculation allows bridge owners to calculate their bridge's level of risk and determine whether that risk is below the acceptable threshold established by AASHTO. So key parameters that go into this calculation, characteristics of the vessel traffic passing under the bridge, vessel transit speeds, vessel loading characteristics, waterway and navigable channel geometry, including intersecting channels, water depths, environmental conditions, bridge geometry, peer protection systems, and ultimate lateral capacity of the bridge peers. The Ashto guide specifications further define how these data are used to calculate each factor in the vulnerability assessment calculation related to vessel frequency distribution transiting under the bridge, the probability that a vessel will go off course, the probability that a vessel will hit a bridge pier if it is off course, the probability of a bridge collapse once a collision has occurred, and the protection factor due to the presence of structures such as dolphins or islands that may protect a pier from collision. Well, good luck getting all the data that you need to make that calculation. And what about the ability to predict in the future or model the increase in size of ships and the increase in the number of ships transiting that bridge location? I don't know how you could reliably come up with that information. But they go on to say here that for bridges classified as critical essential, the threshold is computed as an AF value, essentially of one in 10,000. So in any given year, you should have less than a one in 10,000th chance of a catastrophic collapse from a vessel collision. For bridges classified as typical, the threshold is computed as an AF of 0 0.001. So one in a thousand instead of one in 10,000. So, Again, it looks like a very rational, a very apparently accurate calculation, but I think the underlying data is very much suspect. So what approach should you take instead? I've been strongly influenced by this book, Anti-Fragile, by Nassim Tlaib. I highly recommend this book. Anti-Fragile, as defined by the author, is something that gets better with stress. And uh, we can't really expect that with, with bridges, but what we could really expect is that they be robust, that they could survive impacts or avoid impacts, things of that nature. It's a fundamentally different way of looking at the issue. And one of the key concepts that comes from this book is that so-called extreme events occur far more frequently than people would typically expect. And that's called a fat tail distribution. From a normal distribution, the type of distribution that most people think happened in the real world, which is not the case, you have a very low probability of these extreme events. But again, real life tends to be far different. And there's a variety of reasons for that. I think one of the key reasons is that people don't understand all the risk factors. Just like going back to this risk calculation. How do you know all these variables to any significant degree in order to make these calculations? 
And the answer is you don't. So in this NTSB report, they go back and look at had Maryland officials calculated the risk for this Francis Scott Key Bridge, they would have determined that uh, the risk was overall 0.0029. So it's a one in 344 risk, or essentially 30 times greater risk than the one in 10,000 that is consistent with the AASHTO guidelines. And we know this bridge was put in service in 1977, so it made it 48 years. So the actual risk of collapse turned out to be essentially one in 48 years and not even one in 344 years that this computation would have produced. But again, I think it should be used in a qualitative fashion that, hey, we've got more risk than what would uh, be acceptable. That's the takeaway. Don't put too much stock, in my opinion, on the actual number. So if Maryland officials had this information, what would they have done about it, if anything? Based on their track record, I would guess that they would have done nothing anyway. Other bridge owners have taken action and have upgraded their peer protection to avoid vessel impacts to their bridge. And again, I, I advocate for more common sense approach. If you just look historically from 1960 to 2015, there were 35 major bridge collapses worldwide due to ship or barge collision, which resulted in a total of 342 deaths. So again, these are infrequent, but not extreme events, not as low a probability as people would normally think. This is the Queen Isabella Bridge that was taken out in 2001 by a vessel impact, resulted in deaths. Here's a I-40 bridge collapse due to a barge impact in 2002. Again, there were several fatalities. One of the vulnerabilities of the key bridge was the continuous truss spans that were used to construct the bridge, such that if a piece were damaged or destroyed, it would have a cascade effect across multiple spans, which is what happened here. So as I mentioned, NTSB doesn't have any regulatory authority. That would come from Federal Highways Administration. So as it stands right now, you have the AASHTO guidelines that are supposed to apply to vessel impact risk assessment for new bridges. NTSB has recommended that bridge owners apply this criteria to their existing bridges to determine what, if anything, needs to be done to provide greater vessel impact protection to the bridge. But I think Federal Highways has to take a far more active role here. Take, for example, the issue of T1 steel. It was a type of steel used in bridge construction in many instances from 1960s through the 1970s. And as a result of some discoveries of cracks in existing bridges, for example, the Sherman Minton Bridge that connects Kentucky with Indiana over the Ohio River, in 2011, a routine inspection revealed a crack in a key structural member. And this bridge was made of T1 steel. As a result of that discovery, Federal Highways Administration issued a technical advisory and said, hey, you bridge owners with bridges made of T1 steel need to embark on a rigorous inspection and non-destructive testing program to make sure you don't have cracks in your bridges. And the Federal Highways Administration mandated that this work was to be completed by 2024. And they identified which states had this type of steel for their bridges and their inventory. And they made sure inspections were done. In fact, I've done stories about US 50 bridge over Blue Mesa Reservoir in Western Colorado. And because of the Federal Highways mandate to do these inspections, they discovered they had cracks. And they had to go through an extensive program of inspection, testing, and ultimate repair to address this cracking issue. So I had a drone flight commission. This was at the end of the repair work. It took many months for them to complete this work, but they avoided a potential catastrophe of a catastrophic collapse. So why doesn't Federal Highways mandate in a similar fashion that bridge owners with bridges that are vulnerable to vessel impacts over major waterways, why is it that they don't have to do these assessments? You know, Maryland, Officials have certainly learned from the catastrophe of the Francis Scott Key bridge collapse. And the new bridge conceptually has got a much wider span. The piers will be located essentially in an area where a ship couldn't physically impact it because there's going to be ground all around the piers. So they've learned. Did they say, oh, we're just going to redo the calculation 
maybe we won't have as big as ships or they, we won't have them go as fast or what have you. No, they took a common sense approach and said, hey, we're not gonna let this happen again. We're gonna actually protect the bridge, no matter what the calculations may have shown. You know, if Maryland officials had retrofitted their bridge with greater protections as other bridge owners have, it would have cost about $200 million. And uh, obviously the bridge replacement, the costs alone are around $2 billion. That's what's being floated out there right now. And that doesn't even assess all the indirect economic impacts. So in this NTSB report, they identified 68 bridges located in a number of states where they have identified a vulnerability to these bridges for collapse due to a vessel impact and that these bridge owners haven't done this ash tow calculation so far. And they even list Sunshine Skyway Bridge in Florida, even though we know they have very robust peer protection systems in place. I, I think it's kind of silly that somebody says, well, now you got to go back and do your calculation. I mean, they've already protected their bridge. Maybe it doesn't hurt, but again, I wouldn't get too hung up on the calculated probability as a result of this ash toll methodology. But we can see there's a number of these bridges in California. Delaware, Delaware is actively working on improving protection on a number of their bridges in their inventory. Louisiana has several, Massachusetts, New York, Ohio, Texas. One of the bridges mentioned for New York was the Outer Bridge. They've got pretty significant peer protection in place with these cellular coffer dams. In fact, one of them was increased in diameter after a vessel impact back in the 70s. But this is what a cellular coffer dam looks like. You have driven sheets and you fill the interiors with rock and concrete. And I mentioned the Delaware River and Bay Authority. For the last several years, they've been upgrading the peer protection at their bridges. So what approach, again, do I think should be done? It should be more of a common sense approach. You should take whatever measures that you can to avoid an impact to begin with and certainly to mitigate the effects of an impact if one were to occur. And you also should look at, I think, these bridge owners should be looking at what would be the economic impacts if the, this critical bridge was taken out of service, what would be the potential for loss of life, these are things that don't factor into the ash tow calculation. So please let me know what you think in the comments section. I want to thank those of you who have contributed to buy me a coffee. That's an excellent way to support the channel. I certainly want to thank channel members and those of you who have provided super thanks. Those are additional great ways to support the channel. I'll continue to follow this story. You know, there's a number of news stories about, oh no, we've got the NTSB saying we have a vulnerable bridge. Well, how could people not know before that? And again, doing this calculation, relying on a lot of essentially guesswork to get input uh, values for the calculation is highly sp suspect in my opinion. I think I'm one of the few people out there that's, that's saying that. Again, I think it, such an assessment should be done just to keep people thinking what the vulnerabilities are, how they could be mitigated, but to rely on an overly detailed calculation based on insufficient data is highly misguided in my opinion. So with that, please stay tuned for future videos.